Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to 30 on Thursday with the Tampa Museum of Art. You are watching this either via a Zoom webinar or live streamed on Facebook. For those of you participating with us via Zoom, there's a couple different ways you can interact today. You can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question using the microphone on your computer. You can also open the chat feature and send a message either to all panelists or to all panelists and all attendees. Um, and then there is also a Q&A function towards the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. If you pop open the Q&A, you can send questions that way. Those of you who are joining us on Facebook, please feel free to send your questions and comments um, through the Facebook chat feature. We are monitoring that as well. And with that, I'd like, oh, and if you have any technology issues or concerns, please don't hesitate to send us messages in the chat. I'll be looking out for those to try and help you one on one. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Joanna Robotham, Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Tampa Museum of Art, to introduce our guest. Great. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce or perhaps reintroduce you to our guest speaker this afternoon. Um, we are very pleased to have um, Dr. Bronco Van Open join us again. Um, for those of you who've been following his presentations, he gave a series of talks last fall on the Tampa Museum of Arts Antiquity Collection, Antiquities Collection as well as um, prepared some proposals for our exhibitions that we hope to host or organize here at the Tampa Museum of Art in the near future. So this is our first Thursday, 30 on Thursday of the year. And um, if those of you who joined us a few minutes earlier saw um, Bronco's bio um, on one of the slides prepared, um, this is an area that is of particular interest for Bronco on Egyptian queenship. Um, he studied and received his PhD from the City University of New York and later um, worked for five years at the Allard Pearson Museum and is just a distinguished scholar in his, in, of antiquity. So I'm very pleased to have um, Bronco join us again today and hopefully you will join us in February as well for his first lecture of the year on the Etruscans. So Bronco, do you wanna go ahead and join us? Certainly, Joanna, and thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. Of um, and of course, welcome everyone uh, who is attending today's lecture. Um, Brittany, if you could share uh, your screen for the presentation, um, then we can go ahead and start. But before I uh, present my talk uh, today's uh, 30 on Thursday, I would like to explain the music that you may have heard if you uh, tuned in a little earlier today, um, because what you heard was a live recording by the French singer Sappho, um, who was paying tribute to the Egyptian singer Um Kalthum, uh, and this was recorded in Paris in 1994. Um Kulthum was an Egyptian singer, as I said, uh, active in the 1920s through 70s. She was also a songwriter and an actress, uh, famous as the star of the Orient and the voice of Egypt. Well, Sappho, her name is Danielle uh, Abbi, was active since the late 1970s, a French Moroccan singer who apparently identifies with the Greek poetess Sappho. Uh, so I thought that this music would be quite appropriate for a talk on Egyptian queenship, uh, this multidimensional interconnectedness provided a musical uh, introduction that I felt was quite appropriate. Um, I have slightly changed the theme of today's talk. It's not about Egyptian queenship per se. The main subject namely is an object in the TMA's collection uh, that is uh, identified as the Ptolemaic Queen Arsinoe II. You see her uh, here in the Her Story exhibition that is uh, ongoing in the Tampa Museum of Art. Um, Arsinoe II therefore is a queen in Egypt, but in this presentation I will focus on three uh, subjects. Where does this object come from? What is the provenance? What is this acquisition history? Who owned it? Uh, before it came to the TMA, uh, who is this Queen Arsinoe II? Do we know what she looked like? 
um, what kind of life did she have? Uh, and from there, uh, I will briefly talk about Ptolemaic queenship in general. What was the role of royal women in Hellenistic Egypt is the question that uh, I will try and illustrate. Uh, Hellenistic, by the way, is a period uh, approximately from Alexander the Great to Cleopatra, so the three centuries before the Common Era. Uh, in this half hour or so, I can only scratch the surface of this very fascinating but compli complicated topic that uh, has intrigued me for over two decades now. Um, uh, that was fine, Brittany, sorry. Uh, what you saw there was an inventory card from uh, Joseph Fitch Noble himself. And I would like to thank Bill Zawatsky for providing me with this uh, uh, photo. Um, it shows us that Noble purchased this head that uh, he uh, attributes to Arsinoe II on April 24th, 1957 from a Vladimir Simchovich or Simchovich. Uh, it's hardened fine limestone, which is confusingly called uh, Egyptian marble. Uh, it's not actually nine inches, but eight, seven, sixteenth inches, that is 27 centimeters in height. Uh, as the card said, it's allegedly from the island of Samos and supposedly made in Alexandria. Um, stylistically, the piece is dated to around 100 BCE. Uh, that is the later Hellenistic period. Uh, to be sure, the TMA acquired this piece from the Noble Collection in 1986 uh, and forms the cornerstone of the Permanent Antiquities Collection at the TMA. Joseph Fitch Noble was born in 1920. He was a museum administrator at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and later became the director of the Museum of the City of New York but he was also a prominent collector of ancient Greek and Roman art. Uh, to me, it's not clear why he would have acquired this particular head uh, because he was mostly interested in Greek vases and not in Hellenistic sculpture. The other photo that you see here is Vladimir Simchovic, uh, who was a notoriously quarrelsome professor of Marxist economy uh, uh, or economics at Columbia University but also an esteemed connoisseur and collector of ancient Chinese and Islamic art, uh, which was respected for its breadth and its quality. Um, a selection of his ancient art was exhibited uh, at the Indiana University Art Museum in Bloomington in 1987. If you could switch back a, a bit, uh, Brittany, please. Um, and um, interestingly, uh, sales catalog from 1922 uh, of pieces from the same collection uh, includes a limestone relief which is said to portray the famous Cleopatra. No idea where that relief scene uh, might be, but uh, it shows you that Simchovic had a very uh, wide interest. So uh, when we turn to the next slide, uh, you will see the island of Samos in its context where supposedly the piece came from. Now, if we look at, chrono at the chronology, the history of Samos in this period, you will see that after the death of Alexander the Great through uh, about 280 BC, the island was uh, at least officially autonomous. Then in 280, it came under the influence of the Ptolemaic kingdom, the, the dynasty that ruled from Egypt. And then by 205, the Seleucids took over control. That is a kingdom that reigned from the Near East and expanded its territory into Asia Minor. But then in 189, it came under Attalid control. And after that, in 129, uh, uh, and then well into the Common Era, it became part of the Roman province called Asia, which is what we call Asia Minor. So the Samian provenance is rather unlikely if the piece were to be dated uh, around 100 BCE, uh, because the island was only under Ptolemaic dominance until 205 and not afterwards. So either the dating is incorrect, which I think is likely, uh, or the Samian provenance is mistaken, which might also actually be unlikely. Um, 
The head has been published in 1971 by Yeri Frel in one of the uh, most prominent German uh, me, uh, journals for archaeology, uh, and is there attributed to Arsinoe II. Strangely, it was not incorporated into the general literature on Ptolemaic or Hellenistic sculpture, such as works by uh, Helmut Kirjelais from 1975, a German author who I cannot imagine has not read uh, that journal, uh, or Paul Stanwyck, uh, who published on Ptolemaic sculpture in 2002. Um, the identification in the article was made on basis of comparisons with other sculptures that are attributed to Arsinoe, but Yuri Frel did not make comparisons with explicitly identified portraits, that is, portraits that have an inscription on it that says, this is Arsinoe II. Um, and coin portraits that we will see later uh, uh, should have been used in that comparison. Noble himself first compared his head with the one that you see here next to it. Uh, a still unidentified Ptolemaic queen from the collection of the Nick Galsberg Kliptotech in Copenhagen. Um, I would like to ask you if you believe this image is uh, a goddess, is it divine, is it idealized, is it youthful? Do you think uh, the object uh, of the noble collection is Greek? Is it Hellenistic? Is it Egyptian? Uh, if you compare it with the marble head next to it, you think that's in the same style or is it in a different style? Um, Brittany, if we move to the next slide, uh, we can compare the head of Arsinoe or uh, attributed to Arsinoe with portraiture of Arsinoe's coins. On the top, you then see uh, Arsinoe as a deified queen wearing a veil uh, with a crown and a scepter behind her. Um, and under her ear, you see an attribute that is a horn of a ram uh, pointing to her deification. The other coin is that with her brother, uh, where they are deified as siblings, the Greek above it uh, reads Adelphon, which means the siblings. They have headbands called the Ademai. They have inhumanly large eyes and um, protruding chins, which is a family feature. Um, these portraits are explicitly identified. They are deified, they are therefore evidence of ruler codes, and again the question is, are these realistic portraits? Are they idealized? Um, is Arsinoe supposed to be presented as a beautiful woman there? Um, and here you see an object from the Metropolitan Museum of a deified Arsinoe II. Uh, it, this is also limestone. Uh, it's uh, although the provenance is unknown, it's said to be from Egypt and it is dated stylistically to the late second century before the common era. How do we know that this is Arsinoe? Well, here we have help of an inscription on the back uh, where it says that uh, this is Arsinoe, the queen and the brother loving goddess. So the identity here is very clear. Notice the corkscrew locks and the knotted dress. Um, which uh, uh, has often been called the dress of Isis, but uh, our friend Bob Bianchi has 40 years ago argued that uh, neither the hair or the dress are actually uh, the sole prerogative of Isis. Um, but she also carries a double horn of plenty called a dikeras, and literary sources tell us explicitly that this was designed for Arsinoe. So when we look back uh, to uh, the head in the Tampa collection and reassess the identification, then um, uh, you can slide to the next one. Um, we can look at the material, limestone, which is very common for Egyptian statues, but is not common for Greek sculpture. We can look at the style. I would argue that it is Hellenistic, blending Greek and Egyptian elements. Um, that would mean that it is probably created outside of Alexandria, perhaps in the Fayum district. Uh, this is a theory that Paul Stanwyck has introduced uh, that uh, 
uh, under life size limestone was not made uh, in or around Alexandria or the other large city Memphis, um, but particularly in the Fayum oasis. And it is interesting to note that that district was renamed in Arsinoe's honor and became known as the Arsinoe district. Um, she has attributes such as her chignon coiffure, the hairstyle with that is pulled back with the bun. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little slow here today. Um, and the hair is bound by a headband. Uh, that could be the diadema, uh, the royal fillet. And then this would definitely be an, in, uh, an Egyptian queen. Um, portrait features to me uh, look youthful. I cannot express what a difference it makes when you actually see the statue or the sculpture in person. It looked very youthful to me, much more youthful than on, uh, uh, on photos, so a teenager. Um, but is she individualized? Is she deified or idealized? Uh, those are questions that I would like to put to the audience. Um, now, also bear in mind, and I will get back to this in a little bit, that Arsinoe II uh, returned uh, after her first marriage to Egypt around uh, 275 or a little earlier. Uh, she was at the time uh, at least 35, probably even 40 years old. Uh, and that I think is a lot older than this statue uh, um, represents. So to me, the attribution remains uncertain. I think it's likely a Ptolemaic queen in a Hellenistic style made of an Egyptian material, uh, but I don't think it's likely that this represents Arsinoe II. So when we look a little bit at her life, very quickly, Arsinoe II was the daughter of Ptolemy I and Berenice I, uh, who was his fourth wife. She, the date of her birth is difficult. I've uh, I've tried to calculate, but it's somewhere between 318 to 311. Uh, that means that she was born in Memphis, which was at that time the Egyptian capital, uh, which moved to Alexandria only around 310. Uh, Ptolemy I was a Macedonian uh, whose father was called Lagos and his mother Arsinoe. Uh, so Arsinoe II is named after her grandmother. Uh, and this Arsinoe was a Macedonian princess from a collateral branch of the Argiot dynasty. Uh, according to legend, she was even the mistress of Philip II, um, that is the father of Alexander III. But uh, in historical actuality, that of course was not the case. Um, Ptolemy I was a personal friend of Alexander the Great and a commander in his army. After Alexander's death, he claimed kingship in Egypt and uh, after him, every single king was called Ptolemy. So very difficult to keep them apart. As I said, he had four wives. He was also polygamous. So he uh, kept all his wives in honor. One of them was uh, Thais, uh, and uh, another was a Persian princess by the name of Atacama. Uh, and around the same time he married two women, one of them being Berenice I and the other another Macedonian noblewoman by the name of Eurydice. Uh, who Berenice I was uh, is uh, really unknown other than that she had been married before, so she was not a young woman when she came to Egypt. Arsinoe II was married to King Lysimachus of Thrace, uh, Thrace is uh, a little bit to the northeast of Greece, uh, somewhere around 300 uh, or 299. She bore him uh, at least three sons as, uh, that we know of, uh, and their names are Ptolemy, named after Arsinoe's father, Lysimachus, named after guess who, uh, and a third was called Philip, named after the father of Alexander the Great. So these are all very royal names. Uh, Lysimachus was also a personal friend of Alexander the Great and uh, became his bodyguard. Um, after the death of Alexander the Great, he claimed kingship in Thrace and then expanded his power into Asia Minor and uh, later also annexed Macedon. He too married four women and was polygamous. Um, 
and uh, one of them, of course, being Arsinoe. He also married one, maybe even two Persian princesses, and um, his uh, um, son Agathocles was uh, for a long time uh, his heir and successor, and he was the son of another bride, Nicaea. So Arsinoe became involved in what is known as the Agathocles affair. Uh, that, I think, is the consequence of a succession crisis uh, in uh, this very polygamous situation. In my opinion, Arsinoe tried to safeguard the life of her sons, um, fearing that if Agathocles became king, uh, that Arsinoe and her sons would be banished or uh, uh, <clears throat> worse. So some kind of conspiracy seemed to have taken place, but the victim was Agathocles. He was executed, and after that, Arsinoe's son became the new heir apparent, in, instead of any of the other sons uh, of Lysimachus. Uh, Arsinoe became publicly honored uh, in uh, decrees where she was named by her own name and the title Basilisa, which means queen or royal woman, and her son dedicated statues, for instance, at Thebes. So she was a very publicly honored woman from after the Agathocles affair. Cities were even named in her honor, and she gained control of cities, particularly in Asia Minor. Of course, that was in the name of King Lysimachus, um, but uh, to give an example, the city of Ephesus was renamed in Arsinoe's honor. Uh, and she found herself in this city when Lysimachus died. Uh, after He, he uh, was killed at the Battle of Corripadium, also in Asia Minor, uh, a, a battle uh, against Seleucus from the Near East. And Arsinoe escaped that city uh, by fleeing to the city of Cassandrea, which is in northern Greece. Uh, she ensconced herself there at Cassandrea, uh, with a mercenary army and with elephants, and then married her half-brother, Ptolemy Coronis. Coronis had been a follower of Seleucus. After Seleucus killed Lysimachus in battle, uh, Ptolemy Coronis uh, then killed Seleucus. Coronis, by the way, means lightning bolt for his actions. Uh, Coronis had thus killed Seleucus, claimed kingship in Macedon, and Arsinoe offered herself in marriage to her half-brother, probably again to try and safeguard the life of her sons. Uh, that attempt failed because uh, sorry, Chironis murdered her younger sons while her eldest son Ptolemy escaped to the Adriatic coast in Illyria. Uh, Arsinoe did not feel safe anymore and fled again and found refuge on the island of Samothrace, which is sacred to the mystery cult of the great gods. Um, soon, Coronis himself died against uh, an invasion of Gauls who came into Macedonia from the Balkans, and Macedonia itself uh, fell into another succession crisis. And in this anarchy, Arsinoe supported her son, Ptolemy. Uh, the drawing that you see here is, that, is a rotunda that uh, Arsinoe um, uh, later dedicated. And at the time, that was the largest circular building in existence. Um, Nearby was also an entrance gate that her brother Ptolemy II dedicated on the island. I guess around 276, Arsinoe returned to Alexandria, uh, probably with her son Ptolemy uh, with her. Um, apologies for everyone having the same name, but Arsinoe's brother Ptolemy II had by this time become king. He had succeeded his father, Ptolemy I, instead of Ptolemy Coronus, the lightning bolt. Uh, and uh, again, to <laughs> apologies, but Ptolemy II had married another Arsinoe, who was a daughter of Lysimachus and who we know as Arsinoe I. Uh, this queen had bore uh, three sons, uh, sorry, three children, Ptolemy, who later succeeded his father, Ptolemy III, 
uh, a daughter called Berenice and another son called Lysimachus after, of course, Lysimachus of Thrace. For some reason, uh, um, this Arsinoe fell from grace at an unknown date. Um, the motive is uh, uh, unclear. She was claimed to have plotted against the king's life and modern historians assume that Arsinoe II was involved, but I think that that is uncertain. Now the most shocking thing happens. Arsinoe II married her full brother, Ptolemy II. We don't know why, we don't know who came up with the idea, um, but they were very soon after deified as the sibling gods, which is what this coin uh, uh, shows you, Adelphon, the siblings. Uh, associating them with Greek gods such as Zeus and Hera, who were also brother and sister, as well as Isis and Osiris, the Egyptian brother and sister gods. Uh, again, sibling incest uh, is a taboo in antiquity. In Egypt, in Greece, um, there may have been some pharaonic precedent, but how much Ptolemy II and Arsinoe knew about this is unclear. Uh, what is clear is that this sibling marriage uh, solidified the dynasty around a brother and a sister and therefore protected it from external interference. So now Arsinoe became queen for the third time in her life. Uh, she became patron of literature and arts at the Museum and Library of Alexandria and instituted the festival in honor of Adonis. Uh, the only uh, uh, um, mortal who went to the underworld, to the world of the dead, and came back. And the poet Theocritus uh, wrote a poem about this. Cities were again refounded or founded in Arsinoe's honor. Uh, as I mentioned, the Fayum oasis was renamed in her honor, and cults were established in Arsinoe's honor. Uh, where she was, for instance, identified with the Greek goddess Aphrodite uh, near Alexandria. Um, and after Arsinoe herself passed away, her son Ptolemy became co-ruler with Ptolemy II um, for some unclear reason in, 290, uh, in 259, uh, the two Ptolemies uh, fell uh, out and Ptolemy the son was established as ruler in Asia Minor. So Arsinoe was deified in a ruler cult, and I emphasized that she was a goddess in her lifetime. Uh, together with her brother, they were known as the sibling gods from uh, at the latest 272. She was worshiped as the brother loving goddess at the latest from uh, 270. Gold statues were set up in main temples and even temples were dedicated to, in her honor. A priesthood was established, annual festivals were created where processions were held through the city of Alexandria and the population offered libations on temporary altars. Um, so that in very uh, brief is the life of uh, Arsinoe. If there are questions, maybe uh, this might be a moment to address them. If not, um, I will move on and uh, ask you to quickly look at this genealogy. Uh, not that I mean uh, that you read everything exactly, uh, but you can get a, gl a glimpse here that every king is called Ptolemy. There are four Arsinoes, four Berenices, and seven Cleopatras. So this is very complicated and very confusing. But also notice that in this genealogy, the first generation is polygamous, uh, but after that, the dynasty becomes endogamous, meaning uh, they marry their close kins. Um, many of them marry their full sister, which again, was a taboo, uh, others their niece or cousin, uh, which was not so uncommon in antiquity. Um, Arsinoe II did not bear any children to Ptolemy uh, II. Berenice II was uh, the husband, uh, uh, sorry, was the first cousin of her husband Ptolemy III, and Ptolemy V had no sister to marry. 
Um, here we see some of the surviving coin portraits of Ptolemaic queens. There are only five or six uh, that survive. Uh, the portrait that you see of Cleopatra the first is a unique specimen. There's only one single coin with that portrait on it. Um, these are the most secure source of identification. This is what the, uh, the royal house wanted uh, their queens to be presented. There are also expressions of female authority. No other dynasty portrayed their queens as much as the Ptolemies did. Um, on the next slide, you will see a subject that I'm very much interested in, uh, which are clay seal impressions. Uh, they come from signet rings and they have been preserved for later generations of Ptolemies from around 185 onwards. Um, these are more speculative, I admit, um, but comparing them with coin portraits uh, uh, and so on, um, I think that uh, we can reasonably uh, suggest that these are Ptolemaic queens and this is how they wished to be represented. Again, expressions of female authority, uh, with divine attributes even, both Greek and Egyptian, uh, implying a religious assimilation with these goddesses. Ptolemaic queens were certainly also represented in sculpture and in smaller scale figurines, life-size life sculptures uh, individually or in family groups made out of marble, limestone, uh, or bronze, set up public places in temples, across the Ptolemaic sphere. But when no uh, uh, pedestals survive with an uh, inscription, we have often no idea who it may or may not represent. There are also smaller scale sca statues or figurines. Uh, some of them have survived uh, and much, many more must have once existed in gold, silver, bronze, faience, terracotta, stucco uh, that were used in the private uh, cult in the domestic sphere. As I mentioned, uh, Ptolemaic religious festivals were uh, instituted in honor of queens. That means to say queens individually. There were also religious festivals in honor of the dynasty. Um, these were annual, uh, featuring processions through the cities uh, with libations on temporary altars for which people used wine jugs, as you see here, um, which have uh, survived for at least Arsinoe II, Berenice II, and Arsinoe III. Um, these are, by the way, less expensive copies of uh, precious metal vessels which have not survived. Uh, a, a really interesting story that I like to tell is about a constellation uh, in the sky, known in Latin as Coma Berenicis, uh, that means the hair of Berenice, uh, a constellation that is still recognized today, um, which is the hair of Queen Berenice II, that she allegedly sacrificed to Arsinoe II as Aphrodite uh, at her cult near Alexandria. And the story is that the day after the sacrifice, the hair was swept away by the wind and placed among the stars so that even the queen's hair became immortal. At the next slide, you will see Berenice II with Ptolemy III uh, at uh, an, a gate in Thebes, that is modern day Karnak in Egypt. These are the benefactor gods, the Theoeoegetai, and they receive a millions of years, plural, uh, that is to say they receive immortality from the falcon god Honsu, uh, an Egyptian lunar deity. In the next slide from the Hathor temple at Dendera, you will see Cleopatra VII with her son Ptolemy Caesar, uh, worshipping Egyptian deities in front of them. Uh, this implies that this relief acknowledges the rule in Egypt of the son of Julius Caesar. Speaking of Cleopatra VII, uh, she was the last Hellenistic sovereign um, who early in her career claimed independence, with which I mean sole rule against her own brother, Ptolemy XIII. 
uh, she engaged uh, uh, Julius Caesar in a relationship, bore him his only son, who is officially called Ptolemy Caesar, but affectionately we know him as Caesarian, that means little Caesar. After Julius Caesar's death, another important Roman statesman, Mark Antony, um, began a relationship with Cleopatra and she bore him three children, the twins Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, that means the god of the sun and the god of the moon, uh, and their younger brother Ptolemy Philadelphus, Ptolemy who loves his siblings. Uh, Mark Antony and Cleopatra were defeated by Octavian, the later emperor Augustus, um, and that marks the end of the Hellenistic period in 30 BCE. So we then come to our conclusion. Um, what can we say then about female royal power and authority in the Ptolemaic dynasty? Well, most queens ruled jointly with the king, who is of course often her brother, sometimes even her son, occasionally her nephew or cousin. Um, some even reigned independently. Uh, Cleopatra has a nominal joint ruler next to her, but still she was the one who, uh, who ruled. This kind of prominent public uh, display of power was exceptional. And uh, it's confirmed by relief scenes that I showed you, statues, ritual vessels, coins, signets, and so on in the public and the domestic sphere. In addition, queens were deified in the ruler cult, which manifests their divine authority. Um, and this position of power of uh, royal women is unprecedented. If you compare it with the pharaonic period in Egypt, um, it's exceptional that women gain so much power. There's uh, the famous case of Hatshepsut, um, but very few other queens had the kind of power that the Ptolemaic queens had. And other Hellenistic dynasties certainly uh, did not uh, have that kind of female power, such as the, uh, uh, the Macedonian uh, king, uh, kingdom or in Asia Minor. Um, only some Seleucid queens gained that level of power, but then these Seleucid queens were themselves of Ptolemaic descent. So I thank you for your attention and for going a little over time, but uh, I hope you enjoyed. If there are any questions, I would certainly love to hear them. Um, um, maybe Brittany or Joanna, uh, you have further questions or uh, things that you'd like to discuss. Do let me know. Thanks so much, Franco. I actually have a question for you for your next presentation. Do you want to give us just a little sneak peek preview, not with images, of course, but um, of what your next presentation will be? Um, the, uh, the presentation in February will focus on the Etruscans, uh, the people who lived to the north of the Romans. And uh, it will be in the form again of an exhibition concept uh, to, first of all, to bring together the Etruscan objects in the TMA's collection. Uh, some of them come from the prominent Perry collection. Uh, and then to gather together other collections to um, explain a bit more who these Etruscans are. They are uh, rather mysterious uh, in the sense that we still do not know what kind of language they spoke. There are some inscriptions that have survived, but even if we can read them, we do not know if it even belongs to the uh, uh, European uh, language family to which Greek, Latin, Spanish, French, English, German, and so on uh, belong. Um, so it's that by itself is strange. The Romans uh, uh, admired them greatly and claimed that many of their traditions were originally Etruscan, um, but on the other hand, the Etruscans borrowed many elements from uh, Greek and other cultures. And so it's a very fascinating story to tell that I think with the objects in the collection and others, um, uh, 
gives us the opportunity to tell an interesting story of a people that uh, are really truly fascinating. So more about that next month. Excellent. Well, your talk today was wonderful. I know how much um, this object has fascinated you since you saw it at TMA over a year ago, almost, gosh, um, in November of 2019. November, so it's been yeah. Quite a long time, and you sure filled our 30 on Thursday with just a lot of really great information. Um, is there another object that has caught your eye that you might want to do another 30 on Thursday on? And an in-depth kind of look at one of the objects? Uh, there are so many. Um, cannot think off the top of my head now which one I would choose, but uh, there are a great many. I love the uh, the crater with the Apulian and the Oscan warriors with uh, mm -hmm. the woman in the middle who is wearing, uh, sorry, who's carrying uh, a vase in her hands, which is not the same as the one on which it is uh, illustrated, um, but is actually a vase that is locally produced. So she's very proud to carry a vessel that uh, is uh, of local produce. And you have these warriors in their native costumes, even though it's painted in a Greek style. There are all these elements that point to local South Italian culture that I think is fascinating. But there's so many other lovely objects uh, in the collection that, uh, that I could think of. Um, I do see uh, a couple of questions coming down, but it's difficult to read them all at once. I see that Suzanne, hi Suzanne, asks a question. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm saying that this bust, bust is Probably not Arsinoe II. I think she looks much too young for uh, the age at which she arrived in Alexandria after her marriage with, to a Lysimachus. Um, but of course, that could be my eyes. We also have to take into account that the sculpture was probably covered by a thin layer of plaster, which was then painted over. It may even have been gilded, which changes the appearance. Um, but if you compare it to other coins of Ptolemaic queens, you could easily make an argument that it could be Arsinoe III or one of the later uh, Ptolemaic queens. And the problem is, of course, that there were many other daughters in the family that uh, we have no idea what they looked like. And because they are all literally family, share the exact same genes as their predecessors, they must have, by and large, looked fairly similar. Sorry, you're muted, Joanna. Thank you, Bronco. Well, if there are any, I guess there are, if you don't have any other questions, we will close out our 30 on Thursday for today. And um, we hope you'll join us um, very soon to hear Bronco's talk on the Etruscans. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you soon. Yep, thanks Bye, so, so much for joining. Bye-bye.